All right, today we're going to talk about cars. I've written a number of posts about cars over the years, and uh, we recycle them from time to time on the blog. I think one that got uh, recycled recently is called Drive a Beater, Get Rich. And uh, a lot of people, I think, take the wrong messages when I'm talking and writing about cars. They're not quite getting the message I'm trying to get them. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about cars and what I really think about cars and what you ought to be doing with cars. Um, but first, the first thing we need to talk about is that I don't actually own a Tesla. Okay, stop emailing me asking what I think about my new Tesla, right? That post ran on April 1st, April 1st, right? April Fool's Day. So if you totally missed that, if it totally went over your head, now you understand. I do not, at this time, own a Tesla. But I am still getting questions from friends, friends like real life friends asking me about my Tesla. And my parents thought I bought a Tesla. I didn't buy a Tesla, all right? It was kind of a funny April Fool's Day post because I'm always making fun of Teslas, right? Um, if you had read any further than the title, you would have read that I paid for that Tesla using, you know, borrowings from my whole life policy and speculating in Bitcoin and uh, trading options and individual stocks, right? So obviously, if you got that far into the post, you probably wouldn't have believed it. But a surprising number of readers did. So no, I don't have a Tesla. The only thing true in that post is that my garage actually is wired for Tesla. So at some point in the future, maybe I'll get a Tesla or a Leaf or something and put it in the garage and be able to plug it in. So um, I like Teslas. I think they're a lot of fun to drive. I totally understand why people like them and enjoy driving them, um, but I don't own one. Next point, average Joe. Average Joe out there is poor a lot of times because of his car. For most people, most middle-class people, most middle-class Americans, the reason they are not millionaires is sitting in the driveway. The difference between an inexpensive car and an expensive car on an annual basis it can be up to $5,000 a year. Now you count everything in that, right? You count replacing parts, you count uh, the cost of gassing it up, you count the cost of insuring it, you count depreciation, you count financing costs, you count everything in there. And the difference between a really expensive car and a, and a cheap car might be about $5,000 a year. And if you take $5,000 a year starting at age 20 and go to age 65 and extrapolate it out at 8%, it's over a million dollars. Thus, people are not millionaires. Many people are not millionaires because of what they drive. And I think that's a really important concept to understand, that we are wasting a lot of money in cars. We simply consume it. And, uh, and you don't have to do that. And I know a lot of people didn't grow up the same way I did, and maybe they don't understand that you can get around with a not very expensive car and do just fine. Um, I was lucky that my parents showed me that when I was young, and so I completely understand it and have been able to save the difference. I'm not a car guy, right? I like driving fast cars and fancy cars as much as anybody, but I'm not somebody who is going to rub a car with a diaper in my garage. It's just not what I'm into. Um, so uh, another thing I think is important to know, and I saw this and, and put it on Twitter after I saw it, um, but basically... Um, it was someone who said this, and let me quote directly from this, from this tweet that I screenshot here. Let me find where it was yesterday. All right, here it was. Said, I'm working on my master's and applying to medical school. A few years ago, I made the mistake of buying a BMW SUV, which I could afford at the time. I was working full time. I recently decided to pursue my dream of medical school, but the BMW is a curse. The payments are over $500 a month plus insurance. And since I paid for an extended warranty, I'm upside down on the vehicle. I can only sell it to take an 8K hit, which I don't have right now. I'm living on private loans while I do this master's and literally have $200 to $300 a month to eat on groceries and surprises. To make things worse, the car has had constant issues that the warranty never covers. Something is wrong with the steering column. It's $1,500 to fix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any way out of this mess that I'm just not seeing? Oh, man. Talking about a curse in your life instead of a blessing. That's just the classic car, right? Um, here's the deal. This student thought he could afford this car because he could make the payments. I got news for you. That's not how you determine if you can afford a car. The way you determine if you can afford a car is you look at the cost of the car 
And then you look at the amount of money in your checking account. If the amount of money in your checking account is more than the cost of the car, then you can afford it. If not, you can't afford the car. Okay? Making payments on a car does not mean that you can afford it. All right, here's the other truth that makes it very difficult for me to talk about this subject. And the truth of the matter is that most docs make enough money that they can drive a very nice car and still be financially successful. So despite the fact that this is kind of an important aspect of your financial life if you're middle class, that it really does matter what you drive and it really does affect how much you can save and it will keep you from being a millionaire if you drive too much car, it doesn't matter nearly as much for doctors. And I hate to let you off the hook like that, but it's true. And if I don't acknowledge that that's true, none of the rest of this makes any sense whatsoever. Uh, what I tell attending physicians is that they need to save 20% of their gross income for retirement. Okay, so let's say we have a doc that's either making a lot of money by himself or herself or a two doc couple. Let's say they make $600,000 a year, right? I want them to put 20% of that away toward retirement. That's $120,000. That still leaves them $480,000. Even if they're paying a whole bunch of money in taxes, let's say they're paying $200,000 in taxes, which is a pretty high tax bill on $600,000, but let's say that's what they're paying. They've still got $280,000 to live on. So they could buy a brand new $60,000 car every year and still have $220,000 a year to live on, right? This is not going to keep them from uh, building wealth, right? It's just not a factor. Now, it's not quite the same story if you're making $180,000 as a doc and you owe $400,000 in student loans, then obviously your car is going to matter a whole lot more. But for uh, many doctors, this just isn't as big of a deal. So if you read my post that says drive a beater and get rich and go, I don't have to drive a beater to get rich. You're probably right. You're probably right. You don't. You make a lot of money, right? And you can spend some of it on cars and still be perfectly fine. So as long as you can afford the car by my criteria, right? That you can actually pay cash for it. Go ahead and buy the car. Enjoy it. It's nice having a great car. I much prefer driving a nice new car to driving a beater. I totally get that. Okay. All right, but let's talk about some of the reasons why docs justify getting new cars instead of driving something inexpensive. And what do I mean by inexpensive? Well, let's talk about inexpensive cars. First of all, the best way, the most economical way to pay for your transportation is to buy a used car, let's say a car five to 10 years old, and drive it for five to 15 more years. Without a doubt. It's not even close. If you run the numbers, that is the best way to pay for your transportation. Buy used once most of the depreciation has happened and keep it till the wheels fall off, okay? The second best way is probably to buy the car brand new and again, keep it for 10 to 20 years. The key is to avoid the turnover, right? So you're not eating the depreciation every few years. If you're buying a brand new car every three years, that's really not a great way to buy a car, it's a very expensive way to do it. Same thing with leasing, which is basically the same thing, which some finance charges added in. But when I'm talking about a beater, what I'm talking about is usually an economy car. Okay, we're talking about a Honda Civic. We're talking about a Nissan Sentra. We're talking about a Mazda 3, or if you really want an upgrade, a Mazda 6 or a Nissan Altima, that sort of a thing. Okay, a Toyota Camry, maybe. Um, Geo Prism. I don't even know if they even still make those, but uh, those are the sorts of beaters I'm talking about. And then you give them five or 10 years. Okay. You give them five or 10 years and these cars cost less than $10,000. Oftentimes they're about $5,000. Okay. And, uh, and also I have to kind of adjust this a little bit for the craziness in the car market in the last year, right? I mean, cars have gone up dramatically in price in the last year. The main issue is that you can't get a new car due to supply chain issues, you can't get the chips for them or whatever. So you literally can't go get new cars. You order them and they come in in three months, maybe if you're lucky. And so because of that, people go to the used car market, which has really pushed up the prices of used cars. And so in, in a lot of places, used cars cost 30% more than they did just a couple of years ago. And so massive inflation in the used car market in the last couple of years. So be aware of that. So any post I wrote saying $5,000 seven years ago, you might have to adjust that up. That might now be a $7,000 car. But when I'm talking about a $5,000 or $7,000 car, I'm talking about a 10-year-old Civic. 
That's about what it costs. And about a year ago, I bought one of these. It's the car Whitney drives to school. It's a 10-year-old Civic. It's a 2009. I guess it's now 12 years old. Um, and it cost us 5,200 bucks or something like that. It had 120,000 miles on it. It's had no problems since. It runs great. It's completely reliable. It's what I call a beater. And if that's the sort of car that you will drive, you will save a whole bunch of money that you can put toward paying off student loans or saving up a house down payment or maxing out your retirement accounts or whatever other financial priorities you may have. But that's the sort of car I'm talking about, a four-door sedan, uh, economy car that's known to last a long time. And if you're not sure what cars last a long time, go look around for 20-year-old cars. You will see that there are some brands that just aren't out there at 20 years old, but you're going to see a whole lot of Toyotas and a whole lot of Hondas and those sorts of things. Um, so keep that in mind. If you're going to be driving a car for another 15 years, you want a car that can actually go 20 years. All right, but here's the, here's the things people say to me when they try to justify driving more car than maybe they ought to be driving. The first thing is I'm a doctor. I need something reliable. I got to get to the hospital to save lives. Well, this is a little bit of a bogus thing, right? I'm an emergency physician. So I see the emergencies at the hospital. I know who I call in to take care of emergencies. And there are very few of you that come in rapidly to save a life. It's precious few specialties. So if you are not an obstetrician that's actually doing a significant amount of OB, or perhaps a pediatrician that responds to resuscitations on L and D, um, maybe a, a trauma surgeon at a at a trauma center, you know. Uh, but even there, right? I work in a trauma center. Our surgeons get a half hour to get in. Um, you know, those sorts of specialties. Maybe you can justify it. Everybody else, come on. Who are you trying to kid? Right? Whether you get to the hospital in the next half hour or an hour and a half, it doesn't make a difference to whether the patient is going to live or die. There's somebody there taking care of them right? Somebody's running the code. I know because I'm running the code. I'm there. Even if you're an emergency physician, right? Your person that you're replacing on your shift is not leaving until you get there. Okay. You getting there absolutely on time every day, 365 days of the year is not going to result in somebody's life uh, being saved that otherwise would die. Your partner will take care of it if for whatever reason you're a few minutes late. So don't overestimate the value of reliability. Now let's talk for a minute about what happens when your car breaks down. And maybe some of you, this has never actually happened. It's happened to me a number of times. Your car can break down. It doesn't happen all that often, even if you're driving these inexpensive cars. I honestly can only remember two cars that it were regular things that I drove that had less than 100,000 miles on it. And I shared both of them with my wife. That was when we were one car family. Um, so obviously I'm driving the older cars, right? You got to think about it. When you sell these cars with hundred thousand miles on it or 200,000 miles on it, somebody's buying it from you. Who is that person? It's me. I'm buying that car from you. I'm driving another hundred thousand miles. And so I know what happens with those cars over the next hundred thousand miles. So let's talk about the car I bought to commute in as a brand new attending. I paid $1,850 for a Mazda 626. I think it was a 97 when I came out of uh, training in 2006. Okay, so it was, I guess, nine years old at that time. It had 130 or 140,000 miles on it, something like that. Didn't cost me very much money at all, obviously. I bought it at an auction, but uh, that only saved me a few hundred dollars. But I drove that to work for the next four years. How many times did it break down on me? One time broke down one time. And it was when I went out there on a cold morning to drive it home from work, not on my way to work. It was on my way home from work and it wouldn't start. So the next person that came out to the hospital parking lot, I said, Hey, can you give me a jump? They gave me a jump. I started the car. I drove over to an auto parts store and I bought a battery. The auto parts store guy put the battery in for me. It was real nice. And I drove home. Four years of driving a car that cost me less than $2,000, and that was my only breakdown. Now, I've had some other breakdowns, right? I drove a Durango, which I'm not a super big fan of, uh, and we were going down to Vegas. I think we we're going rock climbing or something. But as we pulled onto the freeway here in Salt Lake, it started not running very well. Felt like a transmission issue. So we turned around at the next exit, started headed toward our mechanic, and uh, didn't quite make it. Ended up stranded on an off-ramp of I-15 here in Salt Lake City. So what did I do in that moment? Well, I called a tow truck. 
right? I have a policy, an auto insurance policy with USAA, which includes free towing. So I called a tow truck. And guess what? 40 minutes later, a tow truck pulled up, loaded my car up, and took it to our mechanic. We got a ride back to the house, right? I think we called a friend, but if that hadn't been available, we would have just Ubered. It would have cost us 15 bucks. We went back to the house. We put our stuff in the other car and we went to Vegas and we had a great trip. It's not that big a deal to have a car breakdown. Let's say we didn't have another car. What would we have done? We would have gone over and rented a car and gone on our trip. Not that big a deal. You're a doctor. You can afford to rent a car when your car breaks down. It's not that big of a deal. Okay, so another breakdown. Uh, this one happened not that long ago with my Sequoia, which just went over 260,000 miles. Um, my Sequoia, it ended up having the fan pulled into the radiator. And so obviously I couldn't drive it at that point. So what did I do? Well, I called a tow truck and they towed it to my mechanic. And my sister came by, picked me up, ran back to my house. Actually, she took me down someplace else first. We tried to fix it ourselves. That didn't really work. But at the end of the day, we got home. And, uh, and it wasn't a big deal, right? How long did I wait for the tow truck? Oh, about 40 minutes. Um, a more recent breakdown I had was coming back from the Grand Canyon. We were towing a trailer with that old Sequoia. Um, we'd been out in the heat. It was uh, 93 degrees, and we ended up in a traffic jam. There was an accident just outside of Las Vegas. Between Las Vegas and Mesquite, we sat in traffic with the AC going full bore, at 93 degrees for two hours, waiting for traffic to clear. And then we pulled that trailer up that big hill uh, up towards St. George and then continued on up the next hill above St. George. And you know what? About halfway up that hill, the car broke down. It started not running really well. So we pulled off, pulled it into the shade underneath the overpass. And we sat there for a while and tried to decide what to do. Well, we were caravanning, so there are other cars with us. We put the trailer on another one of the trucks and uh, decided we were going to call a tow truck. But as we were in that process, I drove around a little bit and it started working again just fine. I think it had a vapor lock or something in it. So I drove it for a couple hours. It seemed to be working fine. We put the trailer back on it and drove it home and it hasn't had any problems since. Okay? These are what breakdowns actually look like and what actually happens in those situations. So let's say you're on your way into clinic and your car poops out, right? What's going to happen? Well, you're going to call a tow truck right? You don't even have to stay there with the car when you call a tow truck. You can just call them and say, here's where the car is. Come pick it up, take it to the mechanic. And then your next call is an Uber. And for 15 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever it is, the Uber takes you into work. And you can even Uber from there over to the mechanic after work or Uber home, whatever, right? Costs you a few bucks and a few minutes of inconvenience. But it's not the end of the world to have your car break down. So this fear of having an unreliable car that breaks down all the time, you got to get over. It's just not that big of a deal, okay? New cars break down too, by the way. Not as often, but they do break down. So get over that fear when you're trying to justify your new car. You, know, you want a new car? You can afford a new car? Go get a new car. But don't use this crappy justification to justify borrowing 80 grand for a new car. All right. The second thing that comes up is safety issues, right? They say, oh, no way would I put myself into a car that's not safe. And old cars aren't uh, safe. So you can use this to justify just about anything. Anything you want uh, as far as cars go. Um, you know, and you would be surprised what you can justify. And it is true that a brand new car is safer than a car that is 10 years old. No doubt about it. There have been some new safety features over those last 10 years, and it is safer. But if you look at the actual amount that it's safer, it's actually a trivial amount, right? Because not only do you have to get in an accident, but that's multiplied by the likelihood of whatever the new safety feature was makes a difference in either preventing or uh, reducing injury in that accident. And it's just a tiny percentage that you're multiplying by. So the likelihood of it actually making a difference is very, very low. Um, so let's talk a little bit about safety uh, features, okay? And you can go back through history. There's lots of history of all this sort of stuff that people have done, right? Um, you know, you go back to uh, uh, 1899. That was when the first recorded traffic death occurred, right? Uh, there was a guy hit and killed by a motorized carriage in New York City. Um, Ford Model Ts in 1908, they started putting in safety glass, okay? 1918, they put in stoplights. 
1914, they put in a stop sign. Um, they put in turn signals in 1939. Seatbelts, 1950. It was a Nash Rambler, right? Shoulder belts went in Volvos, right? They still have this great safety reputation. 1959, standard feature. Um, driver's ed was required in 1955 in Michigan. In 1966, the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act was passed, and that uh, resulted in high changes to both highways and vehicles. Airbags came out in 1974. That was GM. Um, 1984 was the first year that seatbelts were required to be worn. Um, 1985, uh, anti-lock brakes showed up, right? 1985. So you buy a car that's less than, uh, you know, 37 years old, you should be able to get some anti-lock brakes on there. It's not exactly a new development. Uh, airbags became standard in Mercedes in 1985. Um, Anti-lock brakes became standard in Cadillac in 1991. Um, in 1998, dual front airbags became required in all vehicles. In the 2000s, you saw automatic braking systems, adaptive cruise control, lane keeping, and lane departure warning systems. In 2015, you start seeing Google's first self-driving cars being tested. Um, and in the 2010s, you see some other new developments, right? Blind spot and forward collision warning pedestrian detection, some adaptive lighting, some parking sensors, a rear view backup, which is super convenient, by the way, if you if you ever trailer, it's worth it just for that. And, uh, and even night vision cameras that you can get on them. So yes, there are new developments in the 2010s, and there will continue to be new developments. But you got to give yourself uh, a reality check here. What is the difference in a five-year-old car versus a new car today. What are you really missing there? Maybe some sort of lane change safety thing. That's it. What are the odds that that is the one thing that saves your life? They're infinitesimal, okay? If you really want bang for your buck on safety while you're on the road, look at reducing exposure. Move closer to work. Shorten your commute. Go on fewer road trips. Uh, have your kids go to a school that's closer to your house. Those sorts of things have far more bang for your buck than any of this little, you know, lane change crap that you put in your car. All right. Um, you know, most of us aren't even driving as safe as maybe we ought to be. Why don't you start there if you're really worried about automobile safety? Um, but uh, let's let's be real about it and. Uh, and not justify whatever we want just because there's some new safety feature. Because those auto man automobile manufacturers know this. They put in a new safety feature every year for people like you to get you to buy a brand new car so they can make money off you. Um, so you don't have to have every single safety feature that's ever come out with, including ones that barely make a difference at all. All right. Uh, next thing I hear is I have to have all-wheel drive, right? I'll never be able to get to work in a snowstorm or I won't be able to get home in a snowstorm. Um, and so obviously an all-wheel drive car is going to cost a lot more than the beaters I mentioned earlier, right? Your Civics and your Camrys and those sorts of things. And maybe you do need an all-wheel drive. Maybe you live someplace where it really is mandatory, but I'm a little bit skeptical and I'll tell you why. Because I drove up, uh, I grew up in Alaska driving a two-wheel drive car. And guess how often I needed a four-wheel drive? five, maybe 10 days a year. It's interesting to drive down the highway, the first snowstorm in Anchorage, and what you see in the ditch is a whole bunch of cars, and almost every one of them will be a four-wheel drive car. The reason why is that four-wheel drive helps you go fast. It doesn't help you slow down quickly. All it does is help you get up to speed that maybe you shouldn't be at in the first place, whereas a two-wheel drive car, most of the time, you got to accelerate a little bit slower when you're driving on ice. Okay. I now live in Utah, right? Greatest snow on earth. I live at the base of a canyon known for getting 600 plus inches of snow a year. You cannot get to my house without going up a hill that is at least 11, 12, 13% on every side, no matter how you come to the house. You have to be able to go up to a hill like that to get home. So how many days a year do I need to engage the four-wheel drive to get home? Less than five, less than five days a year. Okay, so let's not justify having a car for 365 days a year that you need five days a year. 
especially if you don't live in some place where you need it as much as I do, which you probably don't. Uh, I saw someone move into Salt Lake recently. They're going to live in Salt Lake City and they thought they needed four wheel drive. We have plows that are out there plowing the main roads so quickly uh, that I rarely use four wheel drive. You know, I go up to the canyons most of the time. If it's not snowing, you're not even required to have four wheel drive going up there. And you can go up to the ski resort and back in two wheel drive 90% of the time, no problem. The other days, what do you do? You ride the bus, right? You park at the base of the canyon, you ride, ride the bus up, no big deal. You don't need all wheel drive. If you want all wheel drive and you can afford it, go buy an all wheel drive car. I like them. I have a four wheel drive car. Uh, I'm perfectly fine with you getting one. But if you are trying to save money, if uh, you are have a negative net worth, you probably ought to give uh, some real thought into what you're driving. Okay, next thing. People talk about it being this awesome tax break, right? That you can uh, write this off as a business expense. Most of those people that tell you that are cheating on their taxes, probably unknowingly, but they're probably cheating on their taxes. If you're writing off your entire car expense and you're a doctor, you're cheating, okay? That's fraudulent, okay? What is deductible? Business expenses are deductible. Your commute is not a business expense, much less your trip to the ski resort and your trip to the grocery store and that sort of stuff. That is not a business expense. You cannot write that off, okay? Even if you have your business purchase the car, those are personal use miles, all right? They are not a business expense that you can write off. So stop cheating on your taxes. What is business mileage? It is from one place of business to another place of business. So you drive into the hospital, okay, that's commuting. You go from the hospital to your clinic, that's business mileage. You go from your clinic back to the hospital, that's business mileage. You come home from the hospital, that is personal mileage. That's commuting. It's not deductible. And whether you're using actual expenses of operating your car or whether you're just claiming the standard mileage rate, uh, that's the way the system works. So don't convince yourself that it's some awesome tax break to lease your car. It probably is not. It's probably just a really expensive way to drive a car. So overall, here's the basic principles. Remember that you aren't what you drive and nobody cares what you're driving. You don't care what anybody else is driving, do you? Not really, right? So why do you think anybody cares about what you're driving? They don't. Your patients don't care. And if they do, park around back. Transportation costs keep a lot of people from building significant wealth. It might not be as big of an obstacle for doctors as it is for the average Joe middle class, um, but it can certainly hold doctors back in how quickly they accumulate wealth. Basic transportation is cheap. You can get basic transportation for a couple thousand dollars, maybe $3,000 now with all the inflation we've had in the last year, but it's very cheap. Now that's not reliable transportation. If you want reliable transportation, you're probably gonna be spending five to $7,000. So what does that tell you? Well, if you need to borrow for a car, you should probably never be borrowing more than about five or $10,000 because you can get reliable transportation for that price. Do you wanna buy something nicer than that? I do not blame you. I like driving something nicer than that, but you ought to save up the money and pay cash for it, okay? In fact, get used to paying cash. Um, you know, that is the mindset you want to be in to build wealth is that you buy things with money you saved, not money you borrowed. If you stay in that mindset you were in in medical school and you were living on all that borrowed money, you're never going to build much wealth. And then, of course, if you do this, you will build wealth. You will become rich. You will at that point then be able to reward yourself and do it. If you're a car person, go buy the car of your dreams and enjoy it. Rub it with a diaper in the garage, whatever you want to do with that car and have the safest, most reliable, fastest, whatever car that you want. Um, but if you're actually trying to save money, don't kid yourself um, that there's a fair amount of money going out the door toward your transportation costs. My dad, your host, Dr. Dahl, is a practicing emergency physician, blogger, author, and podcaster. He is not a licensed accountant, attorney, or financial advisor, so this podcast is for your entertainment and information only and should not be considered official, personalized financial advice.